I want to thank all of you for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Keith Miller, professor in the English department, and I want to thank the English department and the African and African American Studies program for sponsoring this event. Uh, to me, this is a very special event, and I'm, I feel very privileged and honored to be here uh, to introduce um, Helene Renee Phillips Baker, who I'm privileged to call a friend. And if you ever need a friend in the world, <laughs> she's about as good as you can get. Uh, we're here to talk about her and her father and their role in Birmingham. So first I want to talk about the importance of Birmingham and then we'll talk about her father and then she'll get up here and, and she'll talk about her memories from her childhood. I'm trying to get her father situated in the national narrative about Birmingham. Uh, a lot of people don't understand, people understand that Birmingham was very important but Birmingham is even more important than most people understand because Birmingham was the climax of the civil rights movement. Before Birmingham, you had the Montgomery bus boycott, the lunch counter sit-ins, freedom rides, James Meredith at Ole Miss, um, the Little Rock Nine. So there are all these protests that were leading up toward Birmingham or were sort of presented that way by the national news media. When Birmingham came, We still didn't have the President of the United States, John Kennedy. He still had not proposed any civil rights legislation. After Birmingham happened, there were lots and lots of civil rights demonstrations that emulated Birmingham all over the South, and John Kennedy then thought he needed to present civil rights legislation. The civil rights legislation that he presented became eventually became the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which outlawed discrimination and in public accommodations, hotels, restaurants, golf courses, public libraries, and also outlawed discrimination in employment based on race and also based on gender. So this is the most important civil rights bill of the 20th century and it was the precursor for the Voting <coughs> Rights Act and the Open Housing Acts that came to Cape subsequently. Birmingham is the most important moment in all of this. Um, Birmingham, the movement started in 1956. In 1956, Charles Billups, Renee's father, and his friend N.H. Smith, who were co-pastors in the church, the New Pilgrim Baptist Church, and if I get any details wrong, Renee will correct me. Uh, they were among the founders of this organization, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. This organization, they agitated for <laughs> racial equality. In their first statement, that they made in 1956, this is their resolution, read by Reverend Smith. We Negroes should never become the enemies of white people. We are all Americans, but America was born in the struggle for freedom from tyranny and oppression. We will never bomb any homes or lynch anybody, but we must, because of history and future, march to complete freedom. And we seek guidance from our Heavenly Father and from all people, goodwill and understanding. So that was the first meeting of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights in 1956. What was really important about this is that they decided, they'd had mass meetings every Monday night starting in 1956 up through 1963. They had mass meetings, they had, pro they had songs, sermons, prayers to protest segregation. This is the only place in the South that this was happening, the mass meetings on Monday night. The mass meetings built up so much momentum, along with the protests that they did, to get Martin Luther King to go to Birmingham. The momentum built up in these mass meetings is what got King into Birmingham. One of the interesting things about the mass meetings was the people who were attending were basically the working class people, the lawyers and the insurance people, the professional people in Birmingham, they didn't want demonstrations, they didn't want protests, they wanted to be nice to the white people. They had a stake in the status quo. The working class people, the maids and the janitors, the people who worked in the coal mines, people who worked in the steel mills of Birmingham, those are the people who came to the mass meetings. Okay. In 1959, so they kept having the mass meetings every Monday night. In 1959, Charles Billups 
was a minister, but he also worked at Hayes Aircraft. He was going home, and his truck was stopped by members of the Ku Klux Klan. He's taken out to the uh, woods, and he's beaten by the Ku Klux Klan. This is his, his statement of what happened. Five or six white men jumped me from behind the bushes with pistols and shotguns. They yanked me blindfolded, tied my hands behind my back, searched Search being threw me on the floorboards of another car. They saw my card that said Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. The car told them what they already knew, that I was working for freedom. They tied me to a tree, tore off my shirt, dropped my pants, and started whipping me with their chains. He says that he talked them out of lynching him because he decided to pray for the children of the men who were beating him. Kind of hard to believe. He finally got back to the city. He got back to the hospital. He was a veteran of World War II, but they wouldn't admit him to the veterans hospital. He had to go to another hospital. Uh, and the chains, his, his wife says in an interview that she gave at the Birmingham Civil Rights Movement, that the chain marks stayed on his body the rest of his life. In 1963, we see <clears throat> the demonstrations in Birmingham. Uh, here is Charles Billups with the uh, red arrow, and this is Brene behind him. <laughs> These are some of the people involved in the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. In 1963, we're familiar with the nonviolent demonstrators being met by the fire hoses and the police dogs from the, the city of Birmingham. So people were marching nonviolently down the street and the police used their fire hose, the police used their police dogs and the firefighters used their fire hoses to confront the demonstrators. Now, King had a problem in Birmingham because even after he got arrested and read, wrote his famous letter from Birmingham jail, which wasn't even published until Birmingham was all over with, but he had a problem because he couldn't get adults to march. They got to, so that's why they had children marching. They couldn't get enough adults to march, so they're running out of options. So King gets the children to march, and we get these photos, these iconic photos from Charles Moore and these other, Bob Adelman, these other civil rights photographers, showing the firefighters attacking the nonviolent protesters. Now, one of them was named Carolyn Mall, and this is how she described it. She was one of the... Uh, student protesters. The dog terrified, dogs terrified me. I was close enough to see they had teeth like knives. They charged at anyone close by, grabbed the children, bit their stomachs, ripped their flesh. I watched in horror as the water sent the protesters flying through the air, knocking them down, pummeling them across the street. Our bodies jerked around and we were pressed against the building. The water stung me like a stinging whip. The pressure of the water blew a hole in my sweater. The water bruised my face and ripped off a portion of my hair. Some of the adults were, of course, upset that their children were being brutalized by the police. So, on Sunday, some of the adults were leaving church, the New Pilgrim Baptist Church, and they decided to march. The leader of the march was Charles Billups. When you read the histories of the Civil Rights Movement, they basically give Charles Billups about two pages. He pops up out of nowhere and leads the march, and then he disappears. This march was really, really important. It didn't get covered that much by the national press because most of the reporters were barricaded off to the side. But this march, King talks about in his book on Birmingham, and he says it's a fantastic, one of the fantastic events of Birmingham. And in an interview, he said, this march showed me the power of nonviolence the way I had never seen it demonstrated before. This is Martin Luther King himself. This march shows up in two books, two Pulitzer Prize winning books about the Civil Rights Movement. This one by Diane McWhorter has a chapter called The Miracle. The Miracle is the march. This book is also interesting, calling the Parting the Waters. This is the best-selling history ever written about the Civil Rights Movement. 
It's written by Taylor Branch, who's a close friend of Bill Clinton. He and Bill Clinton did a book together a few years ago. Parting the Waters is a reference to this march. This is another one where Charles Billups shows up for two pages. What happened in the march is they led to Billups and somebody else. You read different accounts and different people are trying to create, claim credit for co-leading co the march. But everybody says that Billups led the march. So he's leading the march, the thousand people, they go down, downtown from their church, they walk downtown to, Bur to the center of Birmingham. They're met by the arch segregationist police commissioner, Bull Connor, and Bull Connor and the fire hoses and the police dogs. And Bull Connor says, go back to the church. Charles Billups says, let loose the dogs, Turn on the hoses. We're not going anywhere. I will stand here till I die. The police commissioner ordered the firefighters to turn on the hoses. This is when the miracle happened. What happened is the firefighters refused the order. They refused the order of their superior or supervisor at the risk of losing their job. These are the same firefighters who were hosing down the demonstrators that you can see in these photos. This is a photo from the march. There are not very many photos from the march, and none of them are famous. The reason is the famous photos are photos that involve violence, right? They're more dramatic. We don't have too many photos of this mark, but this is one of them. You can see the people wearing their Sunday clothes. And you can see this woman is a little scared of what's going to happen next. What happened after the firefighters refused the order, they marched past the fire trucks and the fire hoses to the jail, which is where they were trying to go. And somebody said, God Almighty, this is the parting of the waters. The second exodus. What was important about this was not that it was reported on the national media very much, because it wasn't. What was important is a thousand people saw the firefighters backing down. They saw nonviolence working. They steal their resolve. They could see they were getting somewhere. It wasn't just the police and their firefighters were terrorizing their children. They were getting somewhere. They're moving toward a solution. Three years later, Martin Luther King went to do his campaign in Chicago, and he invited Charles Billups to go help him in Chicago to work for civil rights in Chicago. And Charles Billups did well in Chicago. He got a job as a personnel director of a major grocery <coughs> store chain. He was in Birmingham. He had, had these part-time jobs and hadn't been able to make uh, as much money as he deserved. So, but then tragedy struck when Renee was 15 years old. When Renee was 15 years old, her father was killed and the murder was never solved. So Renee had to cope with the loss of her father, who was very close to her. Um, Renee herself has interesting stories about her own experiences with the police commissioner, Bill Connor, and with Martin Luther King himself. You know, you go on the King, the King holiday and you hear people talking about Martin Luther King, 99% of them didn't know Martin Luther King. This woman actually knew Martin Luther King. <coughs> she was a girl at the time, but she remembers it very well. So I want us all, you've heard enough from me, I want us all to uh, welcome uh, Brene Baker. <laughs> I'm really privileged to have her. This is the first time she's ever spoken outside of Birmingham. Mr. Keith told you a lot of things about my father. 
and I am Helene Renee Phillips Baker. Um, when I was in, uh, when I was going to elementary school, because my dad was in the civil rights, the children called me Jailbird. So when I said when I got to be grown, I was going to tell people to call me Renee, because most of the people now don't know me by Helen, they know me by Renee, but I have to use Helene for the legal purpose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was very close to my daddy. I was a daddy child. And when my daddy died, it was very hard for me to talk about Civil rights. I hated civil rights. To me, it was just like a bad banana. Mm -hmm. Because so many things happened in that time. The bombing, the KKK coming to our house, throwing <coughs> um, crosses, burning crosses in the yard. We will always be running. People in the community were saying that we were going to, well, my dad was going to get everyone's home bomb, and um, we had to run to grandmama's house. And you know, grandmama, my grandmother was taking care of five grandchildren, then here come three more. You think she wanted us to keep coming there? Mm -hmm. And you can feel when you're being mistreated. It was just so many things that went on in my life during that time. And then, um, then after our daddy died, my daddy died, my whole world ended. I didn't talk about civil rights. Like I told you, I hated civil rights. Anybody would tell me about civil rights, tell me, get out of my face. To me, it was terrible. I went up when I was a little girl, because I could just only tell you when I was little, not while I'm grown, but I can tell you some parts when I was, when I grew up and how I come to tell you about it now. But when I was a little girl, um, I always wanted to be with my daddy because I felt like he was going to get killed, because especially when he was beaten by those KKKs. So I thought I would go, I could protect my daddy. So what I would do, I was I asked him, I said, Daddy, they had a it was gonna be, he said it's gonna be a nice march and everything's gonna be all right. And I said, Daddy, can I go? Can I go? And he said, Yes, you can go this time. So I was all brave, just marching down the street. <laughs> well, they had them dogs out there. And that's when Martin Luther King uh, told me, he said, um, you just hold my hand. And he told them to stop the march and they pray. But my dad, he was in front of the line. He didn't know why, no, really didn't know why, know why we were stopping the march. We were stopped because I was crying. And, he was, and Martin Luther King wanted me, me them to pray so I can calm down. But, uh, and he told me, he said, close your eyes and you close them tight and um, then we're going to pray. Mm -mm, I didn't do that. I closed one eye <laughs> <laughs> and I kept one open <laughs> because I still was thinking that, you know, if you've always seen the dogs biting on people, I just knew the dogs was going to come over and, and, uh, and get me. And then one another incident that we had, um, we uh, the police, we were some boycott papers. And my dad came home and he, he uh, ran to the house and said, you all got to help me get, it was just me and my two sisters, so you all got to help me throw these papers down here. <laughs> we were living up on it, but we were throwing them. 
and behold, here come Bull come the paddy wagon, all these paddy wagons, and the fire truck. And at that time, I had long fingernails. I told him to leave my dad alone. I said, don't you touch my daddy no more. They drug him out of that house, and I had a chance to scratch with him. But I'm quite sure they beat him when he got to that, um, got to that jail. Mm -hmm. So it's been rough with me for a very long time. I'm 62 years old, and I'm just not beginning to talk about, you know, civil rights. And I'm not saying that I'm 100% better, but it's getting better. Robert N.A. Smith told me before he died, he would call me all the time, and he said, Lil' Billups, and then he said, no, you're not little Billups no more. You're big Billups. <laughs> he said, you're not that little girl. But he said, if you don't get that hate out of your heart, you are going to pure hell. Mm -hmm. He said, your dad going to be standing there looking at you while you're down there going to hell. He said, you got to let it go. He said, you couldn't save your daddy. Your daddy was going to go. It was this number came up. He was going to go. But to me, at that time, that didn't matter to me. I was mad with God. And I thank God that he loved me because I hated him for 15 years for taking my dad away from me. Not only did I hate God, I hated a lot of people. Anybody in that civil rights, I didn't want no part, nobody. I didn't talk about it. I do nothing. And I always was like with a frown in my face. When my dad, when we came back to Birmingham, that I missed my dad so bad, I would um, take a chair, because we live close to the cemetery, I would take a chair and sit there on his grave. And see, and when I left home coming here, my husband told me, Every night, I am so proud of you. From where you came from, I would have never thought that you would go to Arizona <laughs> talking about your daddy. <laughs> you know, and then I always tell Mr. Keith, you know, God can turn things around. When I had an article in the Birmingham News about the civil rights and what the KKK did to my dad and what Martin Luther King, he um, gave my dad $1,000. But he, my dad told him, he said, but it's a problem. He said, Renee said, I told her that you're going to have to forgive those people. She said, she's not going to forgive anyone. All she's going to do, I told her, I said, I'm going to get on the chair. I'm going to be a big girl. And I'm going to sit there and kill all, <laughs> all white people. <laughs> but no, I'm not ever sure killing all white people. <laughs> Number one, I'm not killing no one. But God can turn things around. What's the key? See, you playing a big part in it. Oh God. See, remember I said I'm gonna kill all white people. Until all white people made me sick, you know. But look who's happy me. <laughs> He's happy me right there, mm -hmm. You know. So I've come a mighty long way. No way I could have been standing up here. And when my daddy would tell me, he said we would be riding in the car and he would say, Rune. There's peace. You're going to get peace one day. I said, no, Dad, I don't get no peace. I said, I told you to get out of there. Civil rights, they're going to kill you. He said, no, Renee. He said, I have to keep going. 
because I don't want you to go through that back door. I want a life for you. And I'm quite sure he see me now looking down and smiling because I'm telling you, and, and the reason why I just can't sit, stand here and talk to you because it hurt. It's still hurting. It's just like it happened yesterday. Just like yesterday. And when he got killed in Chicago, it was terrible. I thought that was the worst time of my life. I didn't even think that I would function, you know, without him. But I did. And I, and when I got sick, and I, I was mad with God for 15 years, but you know, he saved me. I got sick and died on that operating table. And I'm a witness that I'm standing here today. I was gone. I mean, completely. And they said the heart just came back, just ticking just a little bit. And so, you know, I said that, why God, why I'm still here? And my husband said, don't keep asking him that because it's a reason. And I feel like that reason now, I know that reason is so I can tell about my daddy what they ignored him. They would talk about all these people in Birmingham, what they did, and never would say anything about my dad. And my dad played a big part in that civil rights, you know. And never said anything about anything. Only thing they would say about that miracle Sunday. Well, and I, I could understand Robin Shuttleworth, why you have a statue for him? Well, I have not a statue for my dad. My father died with KKK branded on his stomach. And when we, when I, we, I know I had two other sisters, but I was always with my dad. And his stomach would hurt. I said, Daddy, what's wrong with you? And he would jump. He said, don't touch him. He said, I'm all right. But he didn't want me to touch him because... It was hurting because of that K. KK was branded on his uh, on his stomach. So he's not here to tell no story, but I am. I'm here to tell the story, and I know that he's proud of me. That I can stand here and tell. And it's a lot more to it, but I just forgive me. I can't, I just can't go through it. It's just a bad, it's a hurting situation. My mama died a very unhappy death because she never could get it together after my dad died. And she lived. He died at 68, and she died 2002, and she was sorry. And she would just cover herself up. Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to cover myself up. I'm going to talk about my daddy and what he did for that civil rights. And he said, Renee, I'm not, he said, Renee, I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about all children gonna be free. But he said you're gonna be you're gonna have peace. But I didn't know that he was talking about peace. I do have peace. But it just still hurt to to talk about it. When you that young. And when you that young, a lot of people ask me how you remember. You can't do nothing but remember. Happened to me as a child. I saw all of this, all the meetings, over all the police. I was afraid to, even as a grown person, I was afraid to think. Uh, I said, "Oh, you better watch it out, cause they're gonna get us." My husband he said, "What?" My husband would say, "What are you talking about?" He said, "Don't you speed. Don't go fast. They're gonna get us." You know. <laughs> and he told my mama. He said. He said, Mama, I think you should have taken Renee for some kind of counseling. She needs some help. <laughs> because I was so afraid. I was afraid 
that if you even looked at me funny, I was I was afraid. I was always afraid. But now it's totally different. I'm not, not afraid anymore. Only thing it just hurt so bad to talk about that life. And that life wasn't a good life. We had to run all the time. The phones was tapped. Everybody was against us. All because my dad was in that civil rights. And that morning my dad was beaten by the KKK. I was five years old. And I got up that morning and I said, Mom, my dad is not here. I said, Mom, dad should be home by now. And Rum Smith came just to the, came there with his hat. Only thing he had was his hat. Because he said that they had beat, they beat him so bad, his clothes were beat into his skin. His head was mashed, but he was still talking. So to me, this is an honor for me. Because no way, I'm not going to even tell you uh, 10 years, <laughs> no way five or six years ago I would have been standing up here. I would have told you to get out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to talk about it. Don't want no parts of it. Go away from me. But now I can talk because I'm the only one. If I don't talk about it. Who's gonna know? And it's it's therapy for me to talk about it. Even though I'm gonna cry, <laughs> but I can talk about it now. You know, that was a tough life. It was very tough. People when when I went for a job at the federal bank, just because my name was Lewis. And you know, back then they because I followed my dad online. They had children name too. And they told me that I could just leave. They wasn't going to hire me because my name was Phillips. And my dad was a very strong man. And just like Robert Smith said, and Rich I know knew, it was his time to go. It was so supposed to be here for 41 years. And that was 41 years too soon. You know. But at least I did get a chance to be with him for 15. So. And I'm still a sad person. I just can't talk about it too much. Renee, can you talk about the Doing the homework in the car? Oh, yes. Under the street light? Oh, yes. At the AG gas <laughs> We would go to the, my daddy would pick us up from school. And, um, you know, they always was having their little mass meetings and stuff like that. So he would take us with him because he was afraid to leave us home because he didn't know when the KKKs would come by. So he would take us with him, and so we had to get our lesson up under the uh, street light, you know. And then, um, of course, you know when children are going to be children. So we just was out there fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Martin Luther King came out, and so, my goodness, he went in and said, Phillips, you need to go out there and say, well, your car. <laughs> He said, so I'm going on out there. <laughs> so my dad came out and um, he said, but I know who was the leader. <laughs> <laughs> so Martin Luther King said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go buy her some ice cream and put a chair on top. <laughs> <laughs> so he bought all of us, all everybody ice cream, but he especially bought me one. And, and being 
put that chair on top. He took me in with him because he knew that I was the one out there fighting. But you know, what can you do when you're that young? You're frustrated. you leaving from school and you got to sit on a, on a car and get your lesson, you know, because he out here trying to get some type of freedom. Well, he should have just, well, just took us, you know, home and forgot about all of that, you know. But um, it's some funny things, and then it's another thing. So when I when I came back, when Martin Luther King, when I had said I was going to kill the all white people, Martin Luther King gave my dad money to send me on a trip out of Birmingham so I could see how uh, how other people live in another city. So we went to Cleveland on bus, me and my, my older sister and I. But it was the only reason why she went because I was too young to go by, you know, by myself. So we went there, but the only thing I could do we look at all the different, you know, different people. I said, look at those people. And uh, my, I said, don't stare like that. I said, but I haven't seen that before, you know. <laughs> and then I was on the bus. And at that time, you know, you had to go to the back of the bus. So when I got on the bus, I went to the back of the bus. And the bus driver stopped the bus. He said, uh-uh. He said, why are you going back there? I said, because that's where we have to go. We have to go to the back. He said, you don't go to the back here in Cleveland. We don't go up to the back of the bus. He said, we sit up here. So, but that's what all I knew is go to the back of the bus. You get off at the back, and you get on at the back. That's what I knew. But I thank God, and I talk to all young people, please. Get your education. Because times have been rough. There's some people that died for you. Not only for black, for white too. And all all color. You know. They gone. So now instead of you going backwards, you need to come forward and get you a good education because it's all it's all open up there for you. Because what I think about the killing, especially in Birmingham, you know, and then you're afraid to say things to people because but sometimes I say something, I, I said, my dad, he fought for us to have our freedom. I said, he's dead now. Mm -hmm. He fought for that freedom. He said, not only for me, he said it was for everybody. Everybody. But he used to took me when he would call, he said there will be peace. And he was the type of person that would drive and take his hands off the stern wheel. You. <laughs> you know, he said, but there's going to be peace for you, Renee. And my peace is now when I can stand up here and talk to you. Talk about it. Talk about it. And that's my peace. Because I didn't have peace. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not telling you it's 100% better. But it's better than what it used to be. Yeah, it was better. It's better. It's <laughs> Thank you. Story about going on TV after you got back from Cleveland? <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll we'll have some question and answer to it in a minute. Oh uh, well, it's so still right on the thing. But anyway, um, when I got back from Cleveland, um, Reverend Shelford, they had just integrated Philip High School in Birmingham. So WBRC, this the station in Birmingham, then wanted me to go first because I was the little girl. <laughs> and Reverend Shelburne said, "No, my daughter should go first. So it was a big thing back then. 
but I end up going first, telling my, <laughs> telling my story, you know, and he went, his child went last, you know. But I wish I could, well, I am going to say it. I'm a true person. To me, he was a very selfish man. My dad worked side by side by him, with him. He never said anything. He looked at me. One day I passed him. I said, hi, Robin Shuttleworth. I said, don't you remember? Yes, I remember. Um, and that was it. He was selfish because he could have said something. And I said, Mom, the camp been dead because him and my daddy died in the same year. I said, why are you all still talking about Martin Luther King? Why you can't talk about what he did in civil rights? I said, because you didn't do it all by yourself. <laughs> uh, my daddy had a family too. Why are you all talking about the King family and Rum Shuttleworth family? What about Charles Bill family? Rum Smith family? And all the other families that folks was out there Margin. What about the families that when we hear uh, this uh, Reverend Gardner, Reverend Gardner would call, that's when we knew we didn't know where daddy was located. Reverend Gardner was the man to call tell when they was in jail. And they had been there like two or three days. And we just sitting there in that house. He went, we went over to Reverend Smith's house and, um, and we were just there. And we had to stay there. Because all of was in, in jail. And so, you know, so why why I would have fear? That's all I knew. I knew nothing but jail. And jailbird. That's all I knew. I didn't know nothing else. People come and tap in the phone. You think they the uh the phone people, they came there to tap the phone, to see what they can hear. And one incident, they had a boycott, and this is by my oldest sister. They had a boycott at Pazitz in Birmingham, and my dad told my sister, he said, Charlotte, please don't go there. We have, we're going to be marching down there. But you know, my sister went in anyway. And my dad told her not to go there. Not that he was trying to protect us, but he thought that maybe she wasn't strong enough to be in something like that, you know. But it was terrible, you all. Sometimes we didn't even have food. Either. It was terrible. We didn't even have clothes to wear. Because when he would go to the his clothes, people would sell him clothes. It was terrible. And then when you had to be scorned by your classmates and by your family, it was awful. That's so why I try to talk to all the young people. Please make a better way for you, for yourself. You don't even have to be on that type of life. I spoke at a school in Birmingham, and before I could speak, the children was in there fighting. And I just told them, why would you do that? We used to go, when we, I went to school, we didn't even have a good desk to sit at. When the superintendent would come around, we had to wear on that day a white blouse and black skirt, and I got in trouble. Because I said, I'm not standing up for nobody. My daddy just got beaten by the KKK, and I'm not standing up for no people. And I didn't. I was in the third grade. And I didn't stand up. We had to stand up and, and do this. <laughs> and I wasn't standing up. Mm -mm. No. No, no, no. 
and, but I got in trouble. But I didn't care. Have any questions? Mm. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I, do you still live in Birmingham? Yes. Um, I guess I have a question and then a, a hopeful response to that. Um, my family's from Birmingham also, and uh, 20 years ago, we went from my grandmother's funeral. And as we're driving um, in the limousine past the funeral, you know, on the way to the funeral, um, we passed the 16th Street Baptist Church. And just like that, our mother started crying. And I thought she was crying because, you know, she had lost her mother, but she, was, she told me later that it was because of the church. Do you have any of those instantaneous moments living in Birmingham where you drive down oh, a certain yes. street and it automatically... Uh, uh, yes, oh, I have that all the time. Mm -hmm. I have it uh, at night time when I'm in my bed. Mm -hmm. I have it all the time. And you ever thought of not of, of moving? Or? Uh, well, my husband is retired from the military. And um, when he retired, I told him that I did not want to come back to Birmingham. But he said, we must go back because my mom was sick. I cried all the way from Kansas to Birmingham. <laughs> Because I did not want to come back there. And if I could move now, but I have a son, not a birth son. He's my oldest sister's son, but I raised him. He's in prison in Alabama, and I can't leave him. And it's on the reason why we have to vote. No, yeah, I know. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. I thought that when I left with my husband, I thought that was play that was goodbye. I didn't think I had to go back there no more. And um, but my mom got sick, and my husband said no. And I said no. She come live with us. She can say that house. We she come live with us. I don't want to go back there because that's a bad place. And really and truly, I must say, um, it hasn't changed. It's just done in a dignified way. <laughs> it's still the same. The racism? Mm hmm. Still the same. They just don't burn crosses in the yard. <laughs> but it's still the same. <laughs> Another question? Um, I was just going to make a comment. Um, I was thinking about when you said you spoke at that, that school mm -hmm. and uh, before you could even start talking, you know, the kids started fighting and it just put into my head the disconnect between the generations as far as, you know, African Americans goes. I think, you know, your generation and generations like my grandparents, my grandparents were born in the 20s. My grandma's from Alabama, my grandpa's from Tennessee. And at a certain point, those, you know, that age, they don't really talk about those things because it is, it's extremely painful, you know, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, don't blame them for not wanting to, you know, relinquish the details because it's just, it's really gory, honestly. Um, but I think that information is really key for future generations. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really appreciate you coming because even for me growing up, <clears throat> my grandparents, my parents never talked about anything to do with the civil rights movement. Like, my grandparents, my grandparents and my parents just said, you know, love everyone equally, everyone's the same, and that was it. Um, but I feel like that strength and that resilience that your generation has, I think it, it's extremely beneficial to people my age, younger, you know, slightly older. Um, it gives us something to stand on mm -hmm. and to feel proud of. So I think that you're really necessary and I really appreciate you. Well, thank you very much. And when they... When they, the fight broke out, it was it was on a black history, and um, before I could speak, but I before I said anything, I told them I said, "Why would you want to tear up your school, and why would you hit your teacher?" Mm -hmm. 
what is wrong with you? And that principal said, he just got up and said, you know, we need somebody like you all the time to come here. <laughs> and my husband was sitting there and said, mm -mm. <laughs> He said, no. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. <laughs> because she's on her way. <laughs> Either to the grave or to, <laughs> or to jail, you know. But that, that was something. That one boy just picked the teacher up and threw him on the floor. Wow. And then when the uh, the police came, they go hit at the police. You know, I might not be forever tell the story. Somebody else will come along and tell the true story. But I lived it. I lived it with my daddy. But I always told him, Daddy, get out of that civil rights. I said, because you're going to get killed. Then I used to always tell him, these people in the civil rights don't care nothing about you. I don't care nothing about your family and nothing else. Get out. And he used to say, Rune, I can't do that. Just can't do that. Because one day, you're going to get your peace. You will. And he used to say, <laughs> And my daddy couldn't sing, and he could sing that song, that peace. <laughs> Say, you got, you got to get your, you got to uh, you got to have peace. And he said, you're going to be smiling. There will be peace for you. And, I, and just like I said, my peace is here. It's now. I have peace, but it's not 100%. But it's peace, it's better. Because Mr. Miller can tell you, when he came to my house, when he wanted to interview me, I told him the only way I would talk to him. It took me five days to answer the phone. And my husband made me answer. <laughs> he said, Renee, you gotta be ashamed of yourself. I said, oh, once that's something them people gonna get me for writing that article in the paper. <laughs> and he said, no, this man is for real. You need to talk to him. And I told him the only way I would talk to him, he would have to come to my home. Because I'm not talking to him nowhere else in my home home. And, and everything. <clears throat> told me that he was a true friend. A true friend. Yeah, Ronnie. Yes, uh, you made mention of a high school and you made him talk. And, uh, and I, it's a way for me to name the high school. You tell my Phillips, I'm Phillips, Phillips High School. Phillips High now, school. There was another school there that had a distinguished record named Banks High School. Uh huh. Is that not correct? Uh huh. Okay. Were they uh, both segregated schools? Uh huh. Now, over the period of time, both of them have integrated to a degree. Uh huh. And Banks is still, does it still have that reputation? Uh uh. Banks, it's no Banks. No Banks anymore. Mm -mm, no more Banks. Okay. There are uh, several uh, distinguished Americans, politicians, uh, uh, actors that went to Banks High School. Mm -hmm. They have an unbelievable record of distinguished mm -hmm. graduates. Mm -hmm. Banks High School. Sure did. And, and as a matter of fact, the football coach that had the last good football team at Banks High School, now, well, I, I'm a, I, I teach athletics and race and gender. He's the head football coach at Duke University. And Banks, and Banks High School was a high school certain people could go to. That's right. You just can't just up and go to banks. Oh, no, they had a bourgeois connection. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. That's <laughs> what I said. They're, they're, is that not correct? <laughs> yes. Okay. You are and, correct. Okay. And and they they wanted to hey uh, like when I was in the 
seventh grade, I walked to school home one day, and a mother looked out the window and saw me. With her. She said, "Don't be seen again." That's right. Well, that was all right. I had some other opportunities. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then when you say a walk from school, I think about um, when I was little. We was walking, you no know, Woodlawn High School. Uh -huh. Woodlawn High School. They integrated that school. Yes. Me. Oh, let me tell you my story about Woodlawn. Well, that's when I first got from Chicago, you know, I'm going through this thing by day to day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they integrated um, Woodlawn. Well, they changed out for gym. And this girl, how many go? Nigger. And she kept calling me and kept calling me there. Every time we go to gym, she kept calling me there. So what I did, um, I picked me some seals. And she, she called me that name again, I'm going to cut her out. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. And she said, but when it all ended up, she said, I want to be your best friend. I guess she wanted to be, because I guess she said if she cut, if she cut my hair off, we're going to be cut next. <laughs> but she never called me that no more. The reason I bring up Banks High School is because of its distinguished history of its graduates and, and the football coach. He was a Caucasian that came to Banks High School when they were still in flux about having black students mm -hmm. and black kids back together. And he was able to come there and bring that thing together and had a championship status team. Mm -hmm. He ended up being head coach at Mississippi, at the University of Mississippi. And he was ousted there because he had two coaches on his staff that the guy wanted to do the fire, both of them after marriage. He refused to do so. And uh, he, he left. The last thing I'd like to ask you about mm -hmm. is Eugene Bull Connor. He did. Uh, <laughs> 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 but, hey, he was a, you know, there's a guy in this town might be a Eugene Bull Connor. <laughs> but that man was something else. He would ride in that, um, Bull Connor would ride in the tank. Yeah. He would, the tank. In, in that tank. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Somebody in this county that might be doing that kind of stuff. But in that tank, he when they would come up there and arrest my dad, he would be in the tank. What do you have in his hand? That bull. Him, they call him bull car. Uh -huh. He had a bull horn. That's why they call him uh -huh. Eugene Bull Car. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes. There's a question? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, how did your dad get involved with civil rights? Well, some things was terrible in Birmingham. And they was trying to get things together. Uh, see, could they uh, get us out of the back door? They would have mass meetings. That's how he got involved. Trying to make things better. Oh, that's so sweet. See, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I was just curious, um, as a little girl, I think that it's for you very sad that you were in so much fear that you couldn't be proud of your dad, um, and or maybe outwardly so. Was there any part of you that was really proud of him. Oh, I was girl. proud. I was proud of my dad. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was so hurt. I, yeah. I, was, I was proud of my dad. Yeah. But I just wanted him not to be in that civil rights. Right. Because I was trying to save my I wanted to save my daddy. I don't want to be there. I wanted me a daddy. Not a daddy that's talk about freedom and all of that. You know, and then you remember I was young and I thought that he didn't have to do that. I was a daddy girl, and I wanted my daddy at home. I want to be at home like all other daddies. I, 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 every time my daddy would be in that car, all I could do is see him not being there no more. I was afraid. 
knew he was going to die. Because my daddy was one of those people that if I'm doing it, I'm going to keep doing it. He was a strong man. He was very strong. And he was proud of what he was doing. But I cried many, many nights that my dad, where is my dad? Where is he tonight? And then Reverend Cardinal would come up and say he's in jail. Do you have any photographs that your father may have left from the uh, March or from that time period? Uh, yes, I had some, and but my oldest sister, my mom, after my father died, my mom just didn't care no more, and my sister just took them places and destroyed everything. You know. Was your mother involved? In this oh no, mm -hmm. no. Uh -uh. Most wives, they weren't. They wasn't involved. They they had stayed home with us, with the children. They was out there getting free. I have another question regarding. I like you know photographs and um, graphic images from the past. I like these black and white photos. So, um, as you may know, there's this movie that was done a few years ago called The Loving Story about Mildred and Richard Loving, yeah. the interracial couple. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that movie has um, photographs and movie footage from the 1960s that people didn't even know about all of these years. And so it's just being publicly um, made known in this mm -hmm. film. So I'm wondering, when you do your book, how would you incorporate those important photographs? Well, when I do my book, my book is going to be about my story. Well, right. You, mm -hmm. with the story, for example, you have that nice photograph of when you were a little girl uh -huh. with your father. So I'm asking about those photographs that would be a part of you. Yeah. yeah. And see, doing that back then, remember, I was a little. And back during that time, and even it just not taking me where I would talk about. I don't. I didn't really pay any of that stuff no attention. I tried to block it out of my head. And right now, when Easter come up, even though it's about Jesus, when I think about my dad, because he was beat down just like. He just wasn't on the cross. He was on a tree. They tied him with a wire and beat him like he was nothing and threw him down a hill. Is there ever any justice, sir, that beat my dad? No. No. That beat my dad? No. Because in that district, in that time, they wasn't going to find him. They didn't care. <laughs> they didn't care. Because some of the people who did it, some of the people that we probably go to store and see. And in churches. They didn't care. And guess who turned, who was in the in, in the trunk with my dad? Man, that little, one of our neighbors. <coughs> he had already set it up. One of your neighbors? Yes. That's what that happened. That was, that was always a, kind of a hidden thing, but it happened frequently in neighborhoods. One of the neighbors. That, and they would sell out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, hey, if you go back and look at slavery, uh, those insurrections, how were they discovered? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to say this anyway. A 
a lot of times they already had somebody that was pointing them out. Uh -huh. They put pimp preacher in uh -huh. the name. Excuse me, ma'am. I've got to make it. Got to go, but uh, I'm feeling some. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's thank Renee. <laughs>